computer. Hey guys, P. Ramsey here with Kelly McKay, and I stopped Kelly. who started telling me a story offline. We we're talking about employees. I wanted you guys to hear this. Kelly, t talk about this again. I think that's hilarious, but go ahead. We have tons of employee stories, I'm sure. So it's like, <laughs> we sure do. Um, so there was a time where I was doing payroll, like figuring the the calculations. I just had a sheet of paper. You know, somebody had showed me how to do this until I could get a bookkeeper, and I was doing the payroll, making sure I took the deductions out. And so every week I would have to, you know, uh, text everybody and say, "Hey, I need your hours." And so one of the technicians texts back. And he says he's got, got like 68 hours, something like that. I mean, it was astronomical. Right. Um, it might have even been 78, to be honest with, with you. It was way <laughs> off. And so when I saw it, I'm like, there's no way. Because um, I knew for a fact that two days he was home by like 4.30 or 5. And then two other days he was home by like 6.30 or 7. And I don't, even, I don't think he was even on call that week. So I was like, there's no way you had 68 hours. Yeah. So uh, I give him a call and say, Hey man, I need you to just recalculate, you know, your hours. I just find it. I, there's, there's no way that you had 68 hours. And I said it like that. I wasn't like, Hey, there's no way you had 68 hours. Right. Like I was not, right. I was not, um, you know, abrasive at all. I was very friendly about it. And I was like, man, can you recalculate that? I, uh, just to make sure <clears throat> and the right out of his right out of the gate do you do you know how hard i work for you you know how many <laughs> hours i work for you i said man i know you work a lot of hours i appreciate it like i just want you to recalculate i know i know like thursday and friday you were home by like five o'clock so just i just asking you to recalculate click <laughs> Ooh. he just had, hung up on me Ooh. and so I think it was like the next day um, he needed uh, probably had a question to ask or something, but he had to call me and he called me back. Um, I think it was even later that night. He texted me and said, I re added him. Um, it was 40, 46 or something like that. 46 hours. Oh, it's a big difference. And then he had, you know, we had to talk like the next day and he was like, Man, I'm sorry. I just I just added those up wrong. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I I knew he did. I knew there was no way that they had had that many hours. But it's just funny how, you know, obviously there was something else going on. You know, um, my guess is that he wasn't feeling appreciated, and that was never my intention. But you know, I was working, you know, my own fifty hour weeks, you know, trying to keep up, trying to get all the customers taken care of along with juggling all the other stuff. I was still in the field at that point. And so yeah. it's tough to juggle those things, you know, when, when you're in that position in, in growth mode before you, you can, you know, get to a point where you can actually manage and spend the majority of your time managing. But yeah, I've got lots of employee stories and I've made so many mistakes and, you know, I'm sure I was in the wrong many, many times. I take, I take, oh, yeah. I mean, one thing about me, I'm not afraid to take 100% responsibility, even though if it's icky, sometimes it doesn't feel right. Um, I still take responsibility just because at the end of the day, you know, I hired them for one thing. <laughs> and sure. at the end of the day, whatever they're upset with, if it has anything to do with me, well, then I look at that as, okay, well, what could I do differently? And as long as if I take responsibility for it, it allows me to not be a victim, you know, so it gives me power. It empowers me. And and if I can stay in that space, which is hard to do sometimes, then it's going to be well worth it. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're a good leader and it also sounds you're talking back in the paper days. So a long time ago, yep. and things have changed, but, you know, it's not easy being a true uh leader i mean anybody can be a boss and especially i was talking to a business owner today and he, he he said that he had somebody give him advice that you need to fire yourself and put somebody else in charge because you're not big of you're not enough of an asshole is what he said uh and that's what it takes to be a good uh business manager and i i, I totally disagree with that um yeah, i love the fact that you're asking yourself what did what did i do wrong and, um, you know, what could I do better? And that's not, you know, 
that that doesn't mean you have you're second guessing yourself you realize that you know we all need to grow and learn and, and get better and you know we don't we're not born bosses we have to like it was my first hire it was hard you know at telling somebody what to do my first guy was 40 years old and I was 26 you know and I'm trying I'm telling him what to do and I'm I'm training him and and uh you know that that was tough but but when you say tell him what to do I know you Pete you know because we're we're we have similar temperaments I feel like and I, I know you weren't like, hey, I need you to go over there and get that done. It wasn't like that. It wasn't, you, you know, anytime I told somebody to do something, it was, hey, man, can you run over here and grab this for me and take care of this? Or uh, Mrs. Smith called, need to go back, take care of her. You know, it was it was more like that. It wasn't it was never like um, command and control. That was never part of it. No, it, it was not. And, and I could not tell anybody what to do i'd always say please and ask him and uh his name was george he was he they had mills back then and they were closing down so we had all these maintenance guys that were going to the trade school and so i got him he was you know really good you know mechanically inclined and everything <clears throat> and i you know george can you please do that and please do that and uh, please do the other and he was he was very meek he's very humble and um he was easy to work with but what happens i i, I found this with employees and I found this with customers when you're really nice and you're really pleased, you know, you're saying please and things like this. A lot of people will interpret that as weakness and they're going to try to, 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 to work you, to step on you. And yeah. And, and like I said before, I'm not going to claim being a victim, but I was overtly nice most of the time. And I feel like that, I'm not going to say that never happened to me, put it that way. Yeah, and you have these moments, and it changes the dynamic. And I, I know I changed because I always thought I was a really good boss, and we did have a good culture, and people were respectful. But I can remember being in my office and hearing one Randy. He was coming in, and he was trying to say it low to um, – I think it was Elizabeth, but it was one of the ladies that was there in the front. I had like three at that time what kind of mood is he in today? And I was thinking, who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about me. And I said, and I asked him, I said, why don't you ask that? I said, I'm always in a good mood. He goes, yeah, right. You know? And I guess over the years, you start to harden a little bit when, when you get tired of the sure. abuse and you sure. lose that, that, you know, approachability. But, um, but it's yeah, I think I was always, I think I maintained the approachability, but there, there was, there was a few times where I really had to just like make sure it was known that this is not going to be like accepted, you know? Yeah. 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 And, you know, I remember having those conversations where, you know, that's not my job. I'm not doing that. And I said, well, you know, if, you know, I'm hired you to come in and help me do that. And if you're not going to do it, well, then I have to do it. It's got to be done. And so if I have to do it, then I guess I don't need you. So, you know, and, yeah. and, and I, I, I had this conversation when you guys are in the field and you come back and you go to your bathroom, if you notice how clean it is, I clean your toilets and you won't do this for me. Really? You know, that, <laughs> but I'd had enough, you know, just like, you know, that, that, yeah, a little prima donna stuff. But, you know, there are people, too, and maybe they don't like your guy. He didn't mean that. He just got on the defensive for yeah, some reason. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Absolutely. He It was, I'm sure, an honest mistake, and he just thought I was calling him a liar. But that's not, you know, I, I that's, it's it's people's perception. You know, I didn't feel like I came across that way. I certainly was not trying to be combative myself. I was just asking him to, to check it again. But I've, yeah. I've had a couple of guys, like I, I had some guys that, um, like we're trying to refuse to work on floor furnaces anymore because they, because they weren't smart enough to be honest, they weren't smart enough to figure out how to operate a floor furnace or how to diagnose a floor furnace. So, you know, every time we have for floor furnaces, we just get callbacks. They're just not worth working on. Like they're trying to convince everybody else in the company. We don't need to work on floor furnaces. So I went to that service call, one service call, 
made a thorough diagnosis. There was all kinds of things wrong with it that was being ignored because people were being lazy. Yeah. And, and, um, flat out, I just gave the customer, I'm like, and all, here's your options. Sure. You know, we can either replace the floor furnace or we need a new gas valve and a new burner. And that's going to be, I don't know what it was like $1,400 or something. And that was it. That was the end of that service call. It was, it should have been fixed the very first time that we went out there. That's all, all it took me one time to go out there. Um, yeah. So, and it was sheerly because of laziness. And so, um, but I get it, man. Sometimes uh, it's lazy. A lot of times it's laziness actually, but, and, and sometimes it's like. And ignorance, you know, and I, when I say ignorance, cause I call myself ignorant all the time. Yeah, because there's lots of subjects that I'm ignorant over. You know, I just I don't know anything about them, uh, yeah. or I know very little. And so, current events, for instance. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> the uh, uh, you know, I think there's probably some ignorance there, despite all the training yeah. that we provided. So, when I was in the army, they they you had to go before a board of uh, non commissioned officers to get your promotion to non commissioned officer, and I was up for. That they would ask me these questions, and uh, that was the question on current events. And they were asking me about something about the Olympics. I didn't follow that mess, you know. And I'm guessing, yeah. and you know, and everything else. But uh, uh, that that triggered a memory. But no, back to employees, because I think employees and leadership is a really hot issue right now, and I think it's a, a really good topic. Maybe we should uh, continue down that path a little bit because you and I have gone through this. And I remember yeah. having some people I work with say, yeah, my guy told me uh, he wasn't going to hook his gauges up to that unit, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, you're not, are you? You know, this is this is the old Pete coming back saying, you know, you know, again, you know, if you're not there when I need you, I don't need you, you know. And, and we've seen this shift to where the, these uh, individuals – that are, you know, younger and things like this, not all of them, obviously there's some really good guys out there, but there's a lot of this stuff that they just, they're just trying to build. They, they, they want to build the whole business around them somehow. I, I, I don't understand it. I'm just hearing a whole lot of this, uh, just bad attitudes or not interested in, in, in developing themselves and growing or to care less if they have a job or not. <laughs> just, and there's this I, like I this can... struggle. Uh-huh. Excuse me. I can tell you what I saw a few times is that, um, and I think I think people are dealing with this right now. Some, not all of them, but some, is you have um, people complain. People complain all the time, and we talked about this a little bit about not making enough money. When most of the time, it's just it's what they're doing with the money they do make. Yeah. Um, however, let's just say that maybe they are, you know strapped financially and then and they're actually budgeting their money and paying attention to it and so they're not making enough and then they get a raise for whatever reason or you know they threaten to leave and the boss says i'll go ahead and give you x amount of dollars whatever to stay because i really want you to stay um and whether they can afford it or not right half the time the boss can't afford it they just don't feel like they have any other choice. And I think some of the guys know this. And so um, the main thing, I think the best thing you could do, and I feel like that's where we eventually made this shift. It, there were, I went many, many years not being in the mindset that I, that I could, uh, that people were just expendable. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that this business doesn't need any one particular individual to operate. Like it's going to go on without you. You know what I mean? Like it's going to keep functioning without you, whether you want to be a part of this team or not. And so the, the, uh, the thing was, is I can't remember what I was saying. I just lost my train of thought, but, um, yeah, oh, okay. you know, no so, one person is indispensable. I got it. I got it. So, so like they don't make enough money, but then they then they make enough money. You know, they climb the ladder and they get to this point where they're making a lot more money, and now all of a sudden, like work's not nearly as important as it used to be. 
because yeah. they have extra money. So yeah, you know, now they're not driven. Now they don't have the ambition. It's like once their basic needs are a little bit over the top, a little bit more than met. It's kind of like um, somebody if you won two thousand dollars in the lottery and then you take take th- two, three days off from work next week. Like that's the mentality that I see everywhere. So I that remember that being addressed. It was in a sales training program. And I can't remember who, I think it was Tony Robbins who was talking about this way mm-hmm. back in the day. And he said that certain salespeople that they'll go out there and they're hungry and they're trying to get their commission. And once they've hit that quota, they'll oh, just yeah. go home, turn the lights off and go into depression. And it's because they're coming from a place of, um, of of necessity where the pressure is external and it's not an internal motivation that is it's about the money it's, when it's not about the money you just want to you want to you know you enjoy what they have you a, do. they have a thermostat a financial thermostat that everyone he, talks he, about he 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 coined that and that was part of that example yeah he says you have to you know you got to recalibrate your thermostat and uh, it's kind of funny you use that metaphor but exactly and you know, when we're de- when you're a leader and you're dealing with people, you come up with all kind of stuff. And most of the time, we leaders we're dealing with our own hangups. You're in, you're deep into personal development. I know you understand this better than most, and can elaborate in, in a number of areas. But you know, we we need to be um, fixing our baggage and improving ourselves because we all have it. And but as a leader we kind of have to help our, our team get their mindset right. Oh yeah. I listen to, to, we have, we have to help them get clear on what it is that they want. Well, once, once you know what you want, you know, then it, that's part of the, you know, driving force that helps you remember why you're getting up and going to work every day, you know, keeping that top of mind. So there's, Andy was Andy Friedman or something like that. He's the guy that, Sella, that developed. For Sella. Yeah, he developed seventy five oh. R. A yeah. video of his came up in my YouTube feed yesterday. So this is why this is top of mind. Yeah, and he said if you want a quality of life, and this no matter what you're doing, he said there's three key components. Number one is you have to have a sense of purpose that is beyond serving my own needs. It, I'm doing for others. And, and, and this is important to me. So having a sense of purpose. The other one was a sense of gratitude, being thankful for what you have. Because, I mean, I've lived in other countries. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, it's not the same around the world as it is in the United States. Oh, uh, without question. Yeah. Yeah, you've been there too. But, but I've actually lived there and I've had these guys in my house and I've, uh, I've taught the air conditioning guys and, you know, the guy that worked on the washing yeah. machine and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it's interesting. And uh, guys, we have it made. So there's gratitude. But the other thing that was really surprising was self-discipline. Taking control of the things that you can control and keeping yourself accountable to them. And whatever that involves for you. And it could be exercise and diet or alcohol or whatever, but that those three blended together, according to him, really can enhance your quality of life. And if you hate what you're doing, it's hard to stay motivated, you know, with that. But if you can find that sense of purpose in there, right. And discipline yourself to grow and, you know, so that you can get that next level and, and be grateful for what you do have. I mean, Think about all the people that went under during the COVID mess. And here we are in HVAC. Oh, yeah. We went to another level. We've been, yeah. we've got a lot to be grateful for. So uh, we didn't go to another level in my company. <laughs> it was not like that here. Well, I, it was I, not like, like it, like other parts of the country who just exploded. It was not like that here. Okay. Um, I know they were um, essential. We, you know, at that time, an HVAC greatness in, that, in the group that I had, we were doing these uh, presentations. You were part of the training part, but we afterwards we did one on the PPP program with 
with everything that was going on. And yeah. we had Gary Alex come in and talk on it a little bit. Weldon Long came in and talked about it, you know, some of this stuff. And we had a lot of people that were coming in. And from that, we had a couple of mastermind groups that spun off. And we saw about everybody have better, you know, improved years. Not everybody, but for the most part. And, and, and you're right. It depends on, you know, what part, what markets you were in and everything else. I'm telling but, you, we couldn't even hardly get a, get a, like even a service call scheduled. Crazy. It was, it was crazy for a little while, yeah. but then, you know, eventually it calmed down a little bit, but I don't, it's, it's the Midwest, man. I'm telling you, things are different in Wichita, Kansas. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> My experience <laughs> Nobody believes me. Uh, nobody believes me, but I'm I'm telling you the truth here. It's just different here, and yeah. so um, and uh, one of the things that I'll sh that I'm I don't know if I've if I've shared this before, but the three things that you were just saying that make somebody like want to get up and go to work or strive to do more and have some ambition in life. Um, one thing that I heard was that there was three major components. Hopefully I can remember them all. The first one is that you have a, like a sense that you're not almost like not worthy or you have something to prove. Imposter syndrome or no? No, that's not the word for it, but um, it's more like, I don't know what the word for it is. Um, I, I, I do know like, um, psychology like psychology wise it would be like a lack of self-respect like you don't feel worthy okay. okay you don't feel worthy which means you have a lack of self self-respect which um so there's a part of like this is a three part you know then the second part is that you believe that it's possible so you believe, but yet you still feel like it's almost a yin and yang, like two two opposite sides when that actually drive the machine. Yeah, and then the third part, yeah, it's like a conflict. And then the third part was delayed gratification. Yeah, I mean, you want to you want to become more successful. That's huge. You know, anybody delay gratification. Stop going out and making emotional purchases. Stop. Um, stop you know, just allowing your emotions to run your days. It's kind of like that phone call that I shared in the beginning. Um, that's, that's, you know, at that time during that situation, the emotions overtook the brain there. Yeah. And, it, and, and again, it goes through their little filter based on their insecurities and they go on the defensive and, and yep. that's, you know, we, we all process information differently based on our experiences or our insecurities. Maybe we don't feel like we're good enough and, and I, I think, you know, everybody deals with that to a certain degree, unless you're just a, you know, uh, you know, pompous, arrogant, you know, such and such. And even, even they, on I mean, in many cases struggle with that, but, but yeah, so we, we've well, all typically, got that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Typically it's the, the people who are the most combative have the lowest self-esteem yeah. issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's almost guaranteed. If they feel like they need to yell at you every time they turn around, it's because they feel about this big and it's, you know, programming, it's how they grew up. It's, you know, stuff that, you know, they probably need to see therapy about <laughs> or do a yeah. lot of inner work, you know? Um, There's so much can... information out there, Kelly. Yeah. Oh, I know you, you can literally reprogram your brain. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge, uh, supporter and proponent yeah. like i i, I 100 you can absolutely um, i'm listening to dr joe Dispenda's book right now i've already read it it's on my shelf up, shelf up there and i just went ahead and got an audible because i thought man i haven't listened to it i haven't i've never listened to it so i figured i'd listen to it but becoming supernatural is the name of it and he talks about in the book, he's talking about mind movies, which is a program you can use, um, but you could make your own, you know, if you know how to edit any video or take it, you know, take a picture with your phone and then put it in a video, you could do your own movie. But what it is, is just, it's like a vision board, 
you know, yep. seeing the things over and over and over again, seeing, getting these visual snapshots of what it is that you actually want. And then that's going to help you think about it. Right. And then, um, whatever you're saying to yourself internally, like affirmations, I'm telling you, you can completely rewire your brain to start focusing on those things instead of always focusing on the lack, you know, or, or the past, you know, past things that happened that didn't work out. Um, it's not that those thoughts don't come up, but then they, they come up and then they go away. You don't just sit there and hang on to them like with your tight, bald little fist, like trying to hold on to the past and all the pain that you suffered through. Um, it's nonsense. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't serve you and it's going to keep people stuck from moving it, forward. It, and getting it does. And the longer you walk that path, the deeper the groove gets or the neural network and, yeah. and the stronger it gets. And, and to create a new one takes energy. Eben Pagan, you know who he is? He, um, I think I've heard of that name before. He, yeah, he's, he, he's done some good work too. And he had a program, uh, and it was, he had a metaphor that explained taking on change, taking on a new habit. And, um, he was talking about how hard it is because we're ingrained in that old habit. And it, yeah. you know, it, it takes that initial, energy and the metaphor he used was the space shuttle and he said so the space shuttle when it's taken off and it's breaking free of gravity and getting trying to get up into orbit consumes 80 percent of its fuel and energy within the first 60 seconds just or or, or yeah. whatever it was two minutes something like that uh getting out and just breaking free of the or, orbit and then still takes energy but it's just a fraction. Right. And so whenever we make these transitions. Object in motion stays in motion. You know, that's yeah. another. Right, right. Yeah. Rest. yeah. yeah. But I, I just thought that was a, a really good metaphor. And if we are, if we are to have that self-respect and that, that, that feeling, we have to have, um, we have to look back on successes. And so, establishing many or small um, successes is accumulating and very powerful as opposed to trying to tackle one big one. Right. So start yeah. small, but, 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 but move forward. Right. I heard, I heard, I'm pretty sure it was Weldon Long talk about when he was talking about neuro pathways, he, he talks, talks about it being like a highway system. And like, think about if you tried to veer off of a highway, yeah. like you've got to cut the new ruts and it's, it's going to be a rough road, right? And sure. you, then you got to continue to travel down that path to make it to where it gets smoother and smoother until eventually that's going to be your new path. Um, that's kind of like making changes in your brain. Um, that's kind of how it goes. You're, there's going to be chaos typically. I don't know if yes. chaos is the right word, but. There's no, going to be disruption, step. discomfort, discomfort. Absolutely. No, it'll be discomfort and it's going to be painful and it, it's going to seem like it lasts forever and it's going to feel impossible. And but some people don't like the word uncomfortable or painful. So I heard also somebody say, use the word unfamiliar. It's going to be unfamiliar. Yeah. Cause that's more acceptable, right? <laughs> Well, I, I say pain and it. discomfort all the time, but I'm just, it, you know, it's going to be unfamiliar for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had another thought and I lost it. Listen, uh, I was following your, your thread there, but um, I, yeah, so, one earlier. Oh, I know what it was. So when you're young and the testosterone is booming and you don't know oh, why, but about. I just can't control myself. There's yeah. a transition to where you start to realize that instead of your, you know, being a slave to your impulses, um, it doesn't have to be that way. And you can literally change that exactly what you're talking about. And that, so that means stepping up and taking ownership and responsibility and moving into that unfamiliar territory. That's the first step. It is. And if it's the, it's, 
you know, it's E plus R equals O event plus response equals outcome. And it's, um, I know I've talked about it before. I'll never stop talking about it for the rest of my life because it, it will change your life. You know, you'll stop being a victim. Like yeah. the reason you have what you have or don't have what you ha have or don't have what you want or in, are in the position that you're in is surely due to the decisions and choices you've made. And the way you period. tend to, the, in the way you choose to perceive things. Uh, yeah. I had one, one of my guys uh, in, in our group, he was talking about his tech was just complaining about this and that and the other. And here's, it was a female tech and she steps in and she said, uh, do you have a cape? He said, what a cape? She goes, yeah, because you look super mad. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. Super but, mad. That's you funny. know, and she's made light of it. But, <laughs> but uh, her and, uh, and the other tech, they're always positive and, you know, and keeping things good. And then we have that negative. And it's really the way you choose to see the world. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, having a purpose. But the one thing we didn't mention is um, choosing your identity. And, um and a really easy one was, you know, somebody has stolen uh, that big pipe wrench in the shop. And we want to know who it was. And we turn to you and say, did you touch that? And what's your defense? Identity. I'm not a thief. And when you establish that you are something and you're not something, everything falls into place. Choosing your identity is a really big first step. Do you guys think that Kelly and I nerd out on this stuff too much? Because we probably do. Because <laughs> I love, I can talk about this all day. And, I I uh, have like three identities. <laughs> yeah, three. Identities. When well, I was growing, when, when I'm sure. in the trenches, when I'm in the trenches, and I'm like, you know, working myself to death, like, um, you know, it's like, um, you know, Merv. On Sin City, have you ever watched the movie Sin City? Uh, I remember it, but guy, yeah. he, his character is played by Mickey Rourke. Okay, I know who he is. It's really good. If you haven't seen just the first one, Sin City, it's really good. Yeah, and well, I was like Mickey Rourke when I when I'm like when I'm like in in a zone and like you're not gonna stop me. I'll, I'm badass. Yeah. And, you know, nothing's going to hurt me. I'm going to continue to move forward. You know, I'm, even if I'm like out of sweat, been out of sweat for 30 minutes and it's a hundred degrees, you know, like stupid stuff. I push my body beyond what I, anyone should do. Um, but you just couldn't stop me. Yeah. Um, so there's different, I feel like you can adopt different identities for different situations in life and use them you know, to get you through that situation. So. Yeah. It's really important to be congruent with who you are. And if you're frustrated with things or you, you were talking about the incongruencies, the, the conflict, you know, you, this, and then that, mm -hmm. um, if you've ever done any of this inner work and you, and you, I don't know if we want to go down that path, you reduce it to the ridiculous, something in your brain changes and you no longer have that. So um, maybe Kelly said, well, I, I could uh, I could never be a salesman. And uh, and that was his belief. And I know it's not. But in, right. in this example, I might ask Kelly, well, why can't you be a salesman? Well, it's not my personality type, you may say. Well, what personality type is that? Well, I'm I'm just too nice of a guy and I'm just too much on the side of the customer to, to sell them stuff. And so is selling stuff bad for people somehow? Is it, you no, know, it's, you know, are you hurting people? Are you taking, are you helping? Well, no, we're help. You know, so you take it down this path. People sure. of your personality type are never in the history of sales successful as a salesperson. Well, I'm sure they have been, but so, you know, so you just reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. And at some point you're going, why, why would I even believe that? You know, just, and, yeah. and, and so these are little exercises that you can do to, Make those little minor shifts, but um, yeah, we I, I've got all kinds of analogies I use to help shift people's minds out of that because yeah. there's a lot of people stuck in that. Like there's it's a it's a ton of people and and yeah, yeah it's it's like, uh, it's like when you're in high yeah. school and you're shy. If you were a shy type, some of you aren't. 
you know, if you're shy and then there's all these pretty girls, oh, she'd never talk to me. Then you go to your class reunion 10 years later and they all had a crush on you and you never knew, you know, uh, the potential's there and we just don't see it in ourselves sometimes. We're our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. um, I love using that, those analogies because that's something we all, all us guys can understand. Gals too, obviously, but uh, uh, good stuff. But yeah, employees, I think that you're right. I think that we as leaders, if you're a business owner, you need to assume a little bit more responsibility in that. I know, you know, uh, a per I don't want to say the person because it's somebody very close to me. It confides in me regularly in in his challenges at his business. And quite honestly, it's man it, management is way back in the day. They're 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 behind, and they yeah. admit they're they're top heavy and there's there's issues there. And they're about to yep. lose this this kid. And and he he's burning. He wants to learn. He wants to grow. He wants to you know, and they're about to lose him. So, yeah. you know, when in, in my program, HVAC greatness on, on, on this way back in the fundamentals at, at, at the, uh, at the basic level is we go through the, uh, the cultural standards and we make sure that all of these things align. And as a leader, ultimately, as we develop that, we have, we got what the customer is motivated by, we got what the business is motivated by, but we expect the employees just go out there and satisfy our motivations because, you know, we're the company and we're going to make all this money and employees yeah. thinking, yeah, I'm still making $19 an hour or $20 an hour or whatever, right? Whatever it is more than that these days, hopefully. But, um, but when you align those motivations and everybody wins, that's a, that's a better thing. And then as a leader, when you start to, you, you have a regular schedule. Every quarter, we come in on the one and one Hey, Kelly, you know, you've been with us for you know, six months now. You're making really good progress, right? You know, and then start having this conversation. You know, how, yeah. how do you like it here? You, are you having a good time? Uh, you, wh where would you like to see, what are you struggling with? Would you like some training on some areas? You know, where would you like to see your career go? Yeah, I tell you what, we've got a need to, to, to get somebody trained up in this area over here. Would that be of interest to you? You know, and so, no, we're going to get, let's go ahead and give you that raise. Um, Let's set you some new goals. We'll come back here in three months. And yeah, we're, you're going places and we want you here. We want you happy. So we're, and dude, when you start being a leader and, and actually involving your people on a regular basis and, and listening to them and asking, what could we be do better? How can I do help you do your job better? Is it, if, if I've been letting you down, is there any problems? And, you know, give them a chance to, yeah, speak. we did, we did, um, a lot of people don't think about doing a, um, I mean, we did because I just learned about it, but uh, do a a management evaluation or like a management. So basically everybody anonymously um, answered, you know, 10 questions that we had for him. It was just like a, a poll, you know, and there were questions yeah. like, what do you not like about your manager, your management? What do you not like about, you know, this or that? What do you like about this? So we could get to know like what's going on, what, you know, just to try to get better. That's the whole purpose of it, just to continuously get better. Um, once a quarter, as far as like meeting with every single person, like I feel like it should be a way more often, right? like once a month. Um, I didn't do it once a month, but I feel like it should be. Um, just for that constant, um, you know, um, continuous yeah. yeah i think uh, I, I think the continuous like making sure they understand like we're here for you and all those things yeah so there's the one-on-one -on -one meetings um mm -hmm. there's the departmental meetings there's the team meetings there's the company meetings and so you can spend a lot of time doing that and i think that if you have that healthy balance um it kind of pulls everybody to not just you you and that individual together but it kind of creates a a, a better culture if if we're all doing this kind of together and you know we're all having these conversations i had a <laughs> um a box an anonymous box with a padlock on there that you the suggestions box and you know mm -hmm. some of the stuff that they put in there was most of the time they're just being you know smart Alex, you know? You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's yeah, good stuff but um but um i think we're going into a time when there's a disconnect, we don't see a lot of young people 
very eager to get into the blue collar trades. Um, I think I mentioned this maybe to you or somebody else not too long ago, but my guy in Miami, he had this kid and he was coming along pretty good. And up one day quits. He said he's making more money driving Uber and it's a lot easier. And that's what he decided to do. Now, is that a long-term good decision? You know, I don't know. No. Yeah. I had a guy quit because the um, UPS was dry. UPS was hiring. And it was like seasonal. It was like just for the, oh, so they were gosh. paying extra for the season. And he, yeah. he was a brand new hire. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he hadn't been with us for any amount of time, but that was a bad decision, you know? Um, and now bad... I, I think I'm, I think I'm still friends with him on Facebook and I just see him hopping from pointless job to pointless job, still no career, no career path, no nothing. Right. So I, I, in my mind, you know, I just feel like that's not a good decision. Um, can I, I just share with you, like, yeah, can I ahead. just share with you what, like knowing what I know now and then having time to reflect like what I would do differently is I would pay, I would, for one, I would keep my office staff down to a very bare minimum, just what we need to get by. So I would have cut some office people because we were always overstaffed in the office. Part of the reason is because I didn't want, like I wanted my freedom to be able to do whatever I wanted to work on. If I wanted to build a course for myself, for my side hustle, then I wanted the freedom to be able to do that. Now, most of the time I, I built several courses like during the work day, but the majority of the time I was working on, you know, business stuff while I was there at the office. Um, but if I, if I was going to do it again, I would cut the office staff, go ahead and take on a little more responsibility at the office myself. And I would pay my top producers like 10, 12 more dollars per hour, which is insane. And, and then, uh, anybody who wasn't on board, cut them immediately. Uh, because one bad apple definitely spoils the bunch. And so there was people I would have cut. Um, there's people I would have, I would have uh, gave big raises to. Sure. <laughs> and, and I, and I feel like it's a different world now. Like we are, we're going to, we, people are going to have to pay a lot more period. I mean, more than it's ever been more than I'm an old timer. You're an old timer. Like it's even hard for my brain. Those neural pathways are yeah. pretty are pretty deep in there about what somebody's worth, especially when I know how hard I worked for so long for what I got paid. But things are different now. And so the whole industry has to shift to this new um the new normal. It we, does. We have to, yeah. And that money piece, um, so I've got a a customer in a big city, I won't say, uh, just cause I don't know if he wants to share it or not, but he was like, sure. you know, he's got, had like four or five texts, uh, and he, the competition is, is, is offering more hourly plus a $5,000 sign on bonus to, to come over. Yeah. And he's like, how do I compete with this? You know? And I mean, you get what you pay for. If, if, if you are hiring strictly on money, it's kind of like getting those customers who do business with you just because you're the cheapest. And so yeah. if we don't blend these other things in there, and that, that's what we talk about in our program as well, is there are certain things that you they, that we won't even hire you if you don't share certain values, have certain Absolutely characteristics not. in yeah. place right? That yep. you're just naturally a certain way and and you don't have a certain desire to grow. Now, could you have anticipated the guy leaving for FedEx or whatever? Probably not. But what if now these days we look back and say, there's a simple personality test that we kind of give to see what kind of personality they are and see if they kind of fit for that role. And within there, we, we can sent, we can get some sense of 
is this the kind of person that wants to um, improve themselves while maintaining a balance of, I, I'm not just about me, but I care about others. So I'm not going to do this because the boss needs me, or I'm not, I'm not going to short the customer because I have a conscience and I want to, you know, they yeah. pay good money. I'm going to do a good job. So it's not just about me, but by the same token, I am important and I want to grow. And so is what if there were a test and a personality test, we've seen the disc test and uh, what's the other one, the big one, uh, several of them around there, but what if. Uh, I've never even some... used any of those, but I've got a killer. Um, I've got a killer. uh hiring process that really vets people it's literally just um i mean you 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 people talk and if you if you get them talking they're going to tell you everything about sure. you know the good the bad the ugly i mean it's crazy what have the stuff that's come out of people's mouths sitting in an interview before crazy and they don't even realize what they're saying but me as a boss i'm like there yeah. is no way I'm hiring this dude, you know? Oh yeah. I, I would, I'd love to coach a tech before he goes in an interview. I'd, I'd make sure I mean, he'd get the job because I think like an owner, you think like an owner, Yeah. but they're yeah. thinking from, they're not thinking they're just on impulse. And, no. And, and that's good. I mean, you know, you, you should have that structure in there, but for a lot of us uh, business owners, we don't really understand the psychology and we really don't know what to ask and, and things like that. Uh, we need help. We need some training. We need some guidance. And that's what this stuff is all about. You know, in today's in today's world, if you're dealing with issues and you're not reaching out and getting help, as as abundant as, as the information is today, then you deserve what you get. Somebody was talking about the difference between being frugal and being cheap. <laughs> Got this little cough thing. Being frugal is learning not to spend money on stuff you don't need. But being cheap is cutting money on something that you do need. And that's what you want to avoid. So be frugal, but don't be cheap. If you need it, do it right. So frugal equals delayed gratification. <laughs> don't and buy shit you don't need. That's stuff. a universal Sorry. truth. Anything that you can put yeah. off, the longer you can put it off, there seems to be a direct correlation with the bigger the payoff in the end result. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Good <laughs> stuff, man. And and I almost went like too far with that. So, um, I mean, I don't know how many vehicles. I think overall, I probably bought thirteen or fourteen vehicles, maybe more. Um, I think more, like fifteen or sixteen. And so, been there. Like the very first um, little truck that I bought. I mean, first I bought a, a van, then another van, then a, then a little truck. And by then I was learning all this stuff and man, I just had no, literally no emotional feeling when I bought the truck, like at all. I wasn't excited. I wasn't, I was just nothing. It was, it was weird. <laughs> and every vehicle I purchased after that, I had the same effect. Like I just don't get excited about, even though the business is growing and it should be exciting, that part, like. It should I, be, you know, I wasn't sad about it either. I just was yeah. neutral. So I know that's weird. Thought, uh, and it's but... interesting. You may not have an emotional charge, but that technician who gets that new truck will. I had one oh, yeah. just the other yeah. day on our coach and he says, man, I remember when I was a technician before he started his business and I got this new, this, this new transit. And he was like, I was excited to go to work again. He said, man, oh my God. Nice, right. I would love <laughs> I'm, I would have at least the mid roof um, transit if I'm going back in the field. 100%. They are so yeah. sweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you can, I can stand. I'm, I'm six, two. And now you're, you're six, seven or six, eight, whatever, however tall you are. Six, five, but thanks anyway. <laughs> six, five. That's still pretty tall. And so like, even you could probably, I think you could still stand up inside of one of yeah. those, the, the wow. mid roof or yeah, transits. Yeah. It's just nice to be able to stand up instead of always being on your knees, like, you know, leaning over the side door. <laughs> I know. I remember when I first started having um, a little bit of knee trouble, I opened up my side door, you know, put my knee in, reached in to grab something off the shelf and something popped in my knee. Oh, yeah. And then I had like, um, a, you know, a huge bruise under my kneecap where all the bl blood like 
went under my knee. It was like a blood vessel that burst in there. Oh man. And from that point on, I was like scared to get on, you know, I didn't, I like, didn't, I used my knee pads like yeah. constantly after that. So yeah, I had a pair of knee pads. I but it was too them. late. Yeah, my knees yeah. are pretty wrecked. So oh, too yeah, many it's knee like, we didn't use safety goggles. We didn't use gloves. We just free on burns. Keep going. You know? Yeah. Uh, in hindsight, we did a lot wrong. We, you know, oh, a ton of, wrong. Yeah. But I think you're right where everything's going with it, with the higher pay and everything else. But the, the techs are all talking. You know, you make a lot more money if you just quit and go work. They're hiring. They're offering big money over here. So they've learned yeah. that they'll job hunt. They keep getting raises as they go move around. Yeah. And when I say just, you know, pay them a bunch more money, we still have to. So we still have to make sure that it, it's within like the KPIs that we're searching for. Um, so it's fair to both parties, you know, it's fair to them, it's fair to the company. So, well, that's the way it should be, but there's, yep. there's everybody's kind of not everybody, but so many young technicians are hoping for that job that they can just go in and they just don't have to put forth. They don't have to, they really don't have to carry their load uh, to the level that, that somebody like yourself would ask them to do because you understand your numbers <laughs> and they just kind of, you know, like being a maintenance guy on for the, I don't know, you know, a federal building, you know, great money, great benefits. Yeah. Just kind of walk around. I'm just going to say gun. no comment because I can't even, because I'll just get in trouble if I say what I'd like to say. <laughs> so uh -oh. <laughs> or I get attacked. <laughs> Yeah, but so, yeah, um, there's you're you're right. There's there's um everybody wants to work less and make more. And it, it just my my old wi way of wiring and my the way my brain works, it just doesn't work that way. I um I mean I get it that you gotta work smart, not hard. I yeah. totally get that because I, I just worked stupid and hard for, for many, many years. <laughs> but so I get that. Like well, I did too. Um but there's a certain amount that you do have to go through to get good. Like you have to, you got to push through some tough jobs, like multiple tough jobs, in my opinion, to just get good, to have enough grit, to have enough, you know, the whatever it takes to get something done. Because let's face it, heating and air conditioning is tough work. Like doing a full system change out in a basement or wherever in an attic it's tough work it takes a lot out of you you know but it doesn't have to be um as, as much not today i had a customer when i was at lennox back in the day he was 72 73 years old little wiry engineer type yeah and he would change like um, compressors on those you know real tall uh, condensing units, the uh, signature series. And he, he just re moved real slow and he set up like this, this winch tripod thing that he made. And he, he had the come along chain, you know, and lower in there and hook up and, you know, raise it out. And you know, he just, just slow, but steady. Um, I, I remember him very, we, we, he, he got killed uh, years later he was in a car wreck, but uh, he, man, <laughs> <laughs> I just loved heating and air. So if you really want to be good at anything, heating and air conditioning, business, or whatever, learn to love it. Learn to enjoy it. Because whatever you love, you tend to be good at. If you, yeah, but if you're still doing it at 70, you better love it. Yeah. Well, he you was self-employed, I mean, you know, he, he was, yeah. didn't have any employees, but he was, did you know, really good work. Just, uh, yeah just decided to, to do that. And, uh, uh, but you know, there's a lot of good people out there that do good work. And there's a lot of people that are, you know, they're just in it for the money. They're just in it for themselves. And I think with the economy taking a dip, we're, we're getting ready to get a shake up. So dial in on your values, dial in on what's really important. The money will come and stick to your guns. You know, don't be taken advantage of if you're an employee, but learn to communicate. And uh, if you're an owner and you just can't make it work, there is a way to make this work. You're just going to have to get to the bottom of it and get, you know, get some advice. 
get in a peer group. There's lots get a of coach. ways. There's lots of ways to make it work. There's lots of ways to coach people up, um, or coach them out. It's one one or the other. Like find it, find them a seat on the bus, or move move them to a different seat on the bus, or kick them off the bus. There's there's a ton of ways that you can, you know, tackle uh, the the complications or I shouldn't say complications, but the challenges, the challenges that come with, you know, becoming a leader, becoming a manager. Um, and most, a great deal of businesses who stay very small. Um, I'm talking like one to three people. It's because they, the owner just does not have that leadership mentality. They don't have the management mentality. And so if they're not willing to, to learn and, you know, maybe adjust their styles a little bit, especially from the demand and command style that used to work, you know, um, when I was in a coaching group years ago, when this subject came up of employees, just like not, not like getting in line and doing what they're supposed to do. The, I mean, they would talk about on the coach calls, get rid of him. Get, what are you waiting on? Get rid of him. Like, it was just like that. Like they were just dispensable, yeah. you know? And so, um, I know later, like a couple years later, they quickly changed their tune because that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, people, I think people are inherently good and they inherently, like deep down, they want to do a good job. And so that is true. You just have to look for it and then find ways to help them do a good job. So when you take a customer and you're going to sell them a piece of heating and air conditioning equipment, and they have a belief that it really doesn't matter which contractor I use. Uh, it's all the same equipment. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a carrier or a Lennox or a train or whatever. And uh, so if I'm carrying but that mindset, not. no, no, you and I know it's not, but they're carrying that mindset. They get all the way to the end and you're laying out your proposal and, you know, we'll think about it. We'll let you know. It, it's their ignorance, to use your word, uh, their lack of knowledge and understanding of that. Um will not allow them to make an intelligent decision because they don't have all the information. Now, if during the process from the very get go, we understand that this is common out there and we use third party information and we, and we talk about that North Carolina alternative energy corporation study they did back in the day. And they found that out of 10 brand new systems installed, one of them got installed wrong, uh, right. And nine out of 10 had some kind of energy wasting problem improper charge, airflow problems, air restrictions, you know, undersized return, all these different things. And we talk about what a proper installation is. And so you're, 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 you're part of your process. You revisit this and a little bit later, you revisit a, a different aspect of that. By the time they get there, if that objection comes up, you either can't get through to them or you didn't do your job. And so yeah. I think it's similarly with employees. They come in with this mindset. They, they have no idea of what you as a business owner, you know, what has to come together in order to keep them employed and get them the money that they want. And until we give them that education and include them in that, there's going to be a disconnect. And they're going to do what they think is right. Half, half the supply houses interest. out there, half the supply houses don't put the prices on their sheets. So if a technician has to pick something up or a piece of equipment, that way they can't see how much it is, which is ridiculous. But I know why they do it because the technician says, Hey, this is an $800 yeah. coil. It's a $800 coil. I'm, I'm installing this for $2,800 or $3,600. Holy cow. They're getting rich off of me. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, that's their immediate thoughts. They just, but it's cause they don't understand it. it but It was mine. Even if you, mine. even if you, um, I'm here to tell you that, you know, if, this is why you just pay them as much as you can and still make money. I mean, you have to take care of the business first. 
but the people who are out there on the front lines, we got to pay them as much as we can. That's my new, like, that's what I would do if I was going to start all over again, because, um, the bottom line is, is you got to have a team. You got to have people if you want to grow and expand and you've got to duplicate what you do in order to increase the possibility of what's possible. You know, otherwise you just stay stuck. And if you pay them enough, then it makes it really hard for them to leave. Yeah, that's entanglement. There's multiple currencies. It is. There's multiple currencies. There's, okay, they come in and do this work for you, the owner. You give them money. That's one currency. And that's that's the key currency. That's why we do this kind of stuff. But sometimes you need more than money. Sometimes you need the currency of recognition, the currency of appreciation, currency of belonging and being part of something. And so once you identify what those are and you learn to create a culture that 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 not only delivers that, but a process that that allows you to employ people that are looking the money is important to all of us. And and, and I think you're right. A hundred percent, Kelly, you, you got to pay them well, but we got to pay them in these other currencies as well. And if oh, you yeah. get that right, if they ever leave, they will be back. They will be back. You yeah, pretty, excuse uh, me. yeah. They'll realize just how, how good it was. Um, if you can do those things for sure. Awesome um, but stuff, what yeah. we, what you were saying about sales, the sales process, this is with any sales process. When I went to go test drive my car that we currently drive, we got in and I we get like six blocks away from the dealership and the gal says, has anybody told you how we do business here? And I'm like, no, um, go ahead and please tell me. She's like, well, we negotiate the price before we purchase the car and we just pass those savings right on to the customer. So there is no negotiation at the end because that's probably their, their main objection that they always have to deal with. So we have main objections too. And the most common ones are, I want to think about it, brand sometimes, price, and three bids. Like I want to get three bids or I need to get multiple bids, whatever. And so, yeah, throughout the sales process, you have to be closing you know, the way Weldon Long describes, you got to close those doors because they're trying to escape down the hallway, right? <laughs> um, but it, yeah. it's true. It's And so that's what that gal did when I took that test drive. She was closing that door because she didn't, she didn't yeah. want it to come up at the end when it you was time to that. talk about the money. And if you don't talk about these things before it gets to the end, well, then you're going to get, well, we want to think about it, you know, and Right, right. I, I got a car story for you too. I, I just have to share because it was so good. You do, you, you do have to handle the objections as part of the process, but you also have to create desire. So I had remarried, and I had a younger, much younger wife at the time, and uh, you know I'm remarried again, and you know, but anyway, and I was looking at a car. Well, I had a company car because I was working for I think Lennox at the time, and um. I went to look at getting a, another car, you know, for, uh, cause I'd, I got rid of whatever I had, but, um, so I was looking at the infinity and it was practical, this particular model, but they, this was a, a used car place, but they were only slightly used. These were relatively new vehicles. And I decided to test drove, drive the BMW. So the salesman gets in with me. It's a 335i coupe. Uh, we get out, uh, you know, we're riding around, we get on the service road and I'm like, it's just like, I mean, it was nice. I'm way down in there. It felt really nice. But he says, uh, can you pull over right over here? I want to show you something. And we're on the service. I would pull over and park the car. And I said, roll the window up. He said, don't matter. Come here a minute. And, and so we step over and he says, you see that over there? And he's pointing at the car. I go, yeah. And he says, that's your car. And when you pull up with your lady, you're stepping out. That's there. good. That's <laughs> it good. was terrible. <laughs> I got mad. I was like, man, you don't do that. Everything else. I bought that car. He's tying that yeah. emotion. 
you know, yeah, cinching that down. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I hadn't. The headlight went out, cost me fifteen hundred dollars just for the part. You know, just it yeah. started. You know, but uh, yeah, yeah, that emotion. If you can get that in HVAC, like you said uh, on our last time, that's that's really powerful. But there are other emotions too that we have to focus. Yeah, on. and some there's there's other ways that don't have to do with even the system where you can touch on those emotions with customers. Um, yeah. Just for an example, you know, I was given a presentation one time and, and, you know, I paid attention to their kid's bedroom, you know, their bedroom, the kid's bedroom was um, cold all the time. And so, or hot, depending on what time of year it was. And so I can't remember his name at this point, but let's say it was like Aiden or Adrian or something. And I said, you know, I just, and when you throw the kid's name into it, like you paid that much attention, it makes a difference. You know, when you're talking to the customer, like, and here's what I came up for a solution for Aiden's bedroom. We're going to add, you know, right now you've got like a four inch register in there, a four inch round supply, only good for, I don't know, 30 CFM or something. So we need to up that, up that. I'm going to go ahead and pull that out. We're going to put in a six inch, which will give us hundred CFM. That's going to be a little more than we need, but that way he'll stay plenty warm and he'll stay plenty cool, whatever. And just talk, to, you know, make sure and tie that in. And they were sold. I mean, that's, it's, it's not hard when you just pay attention and you, you care too. Well, you know, yeah. honestly, if they're, if they're open to it, like some people are just not open to it and you might not be able to get through that. You know, they got that, they got their, their shield up. If you can't break that shield somehow. Well, not every customer. And you're going to struggle. You. Not every customer. You. But what you did yeah. there, first of all, it's genius. Great job. But when you're dealing with a child or a loved one, it, you know, I'll, I'll take the sacrifice all day, but I'm not going to have my my child getting sick because it's too cold in the winter or getting, you know, and they're sweating all night because it's too hot or, you know, I don't, I want my child comfortable. And um, that's, that's pretty, that that's pretty, pretty genius what you did there. I like that. We will always do more for others than we'll do for ourselves. Yes. So that's one of those psychological things that if you can tie that in somehow in any way, shape or form, well, they may they might not personally like go ahead and get the quieter unit, you know, the more efficient quieter unit. But if their daughter complains about it because it's right outside her bedroom, they'll do it for her for their daughter. <laughs> so absolutely, uh, just, McDonald's yeah. built a business on that. So, and that's the thing too is if you when you notice those things, like here's the air conditioner out here, it's right in front of this bedroom window. Whose bedroom is that? You go in, you find out. You know, um, even if it's like a detective that's silently. Right there. You know? <laughs> hey, that's experience talking right there. It, it takes a while yeah. to pick up on those things, but uh, yeah. that, absolutely. Well, Kelly, we started off yeah. talking about employees and we ended up talking about sales, but we covered a lot in the middle. Um, I think we've gone through about an hour. We had a technical glitch there, so I'm not sure the time, but. Um, we got to be close. Yeah, we got to be close. Yeah. Well, great job. So um, you guys, um, we appreciate any comments you guys make if you stuck around this long. And um, if you, you know, you you want some topics discussed, we can go deep, you know, we'll talk about whatever you want. This is all about you. It's about our business. We want to share, you know, we've, we've been there. We can help you on your journey. That's what it's all about. You know, that's part of our purpose, you know, help others. We've helped ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Please leave us a comment below. Um, something you want us to talk about or a question you want want answered. We will be glad to do so. Okay. Awesome. You guys be safe. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. See ya.